to be here. And I am delighted to be able to celebrate the 200th birth that, uh, birthday of uh, Charles Darwin. Um, as a philosopher, I have to face the fact that some of the most important philosophical thinkers were not philosophers. They were scientists and others, but here are a few heroes of philosophy who were not professors of philosophy. And uh, perhaps you can identify them. On the top row we have physicists, uh, Newton and Einstein. And then we have Freud. And someone perhaps a little less known to you, that's Alan Turing in the bottom right, who is as good as, as anyone. He's the, the inventor of the uh, computer. But if these are all heroes of philosophy, the number one philosopher who wasn't a philosopher has got to be Charles Darwin. Now sometimes when I show this slide, people <laughs> think that perhaps my, my uh, reverence for this man has gone uh, out of bounds. Now I don't know why they say that. I, I myself don't see the, the resemblance. I mean, wearing glasses, shorter beard, all this. But uh, be that as it may, I, uh, I am pleased to look like Charles Darwin, but that wasn't intentional. I was, I was setting up to look like Rasputin. <laughs> And uh, I just got older. <laughs> well, Darwin's idea, the idea of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, is, as I have often said, I think the best idea anybody ever had. If I were to give a prize, I would give it for this idea. The question is, why is it so great? And the answer is very simple. It's that this idea united the world of purposeless causation on the one hand, the world of physics and chemistry, you might say, with the world of meaning. From physics to ethics and poetry, all in one unified perspective. That's the great achievement of Darwin's idea. Now, it's not as if there wasn't a candidate for a unified perspective before Darwin. The pre-Darwinian worldview was indeed purportedly unified under a slightly different perspective made famous in the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo. And if we look at the central panel, we see uh, God putting the finishing touches on one of his creations, namely Adam, the first member of our species, Homo sapiens. We may call this vision the trickle-down theory of creation. It's trickled down in the sense that God is a, an intelligent creator, a wonderful, magnificent, beyond comparison, uh, fascinating, wonderful, powerful, big thing, making lesser things. And I have a feeling that this idea may even predate our species. It may be that an earlier hominid, Homo habilis, the handyman, the only tools that he made were, were, were uh, chipped stone cutters. But he may have had this dim sense that you never see an axe making an axe maker. You never see a pot making a potter. You never see a, a horseshoe making a blacksmith. It's always the other way around. Big, fancy, wonderful things making less exalted things. And then along comes Darwin with an alternative, the bubble-up theory of creation. Here is the idea as it appears in summary form at the end of chapter 4 of Origin of Species, uh, a book that is exactly 150 years old this year. And it is an argument, and I'm going to highlight the argument parts. It's this passage really is wonderful because it shows both the logical argument and the empirical basis on, on which it is founded, all in one short paragraph. So I am going to just take, take a minute to read this uh, with you. Uh, you should read the whole book. It's a wonderful book. It's a very good read. It's good literature in addition to being great science. So here we go. If 
during the long course of ages and under varying conditions of life, organic beings vary at all in the several parts of their organization. And, I think this cannot be disputed, if there be, owing to the high geometric powers of increase of each species at some age, season, or year, a severe struggle for life, and this certainly cannot be disputed, then, Considering the infinite complexity of the relations of all organic beings to each other and to their conditions of existence, causing an infinite diversity in structure, constitution, and habits to be advantageous to them, I think it would be a most extraordinary fact if no variation ever had occurred useful to each being's own welfare. In the same way as so many variations have occurred useful to man. He's thinking about domesticated species. But then, if variations useful to any organic being do occur, assuredly individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life. And from the strong principle of inheritance, that is, they'll be more like their parents than like the parents of their competition. From the strong principle of inheritance, they will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized. This principle of preservation I have called for the sake of brevity, natural selection. There it is on a single screen. That's the dangerous idea. That's the brilliant idea of natural selection. The details, of course, are endlessly fascinating. But this is the skeleton. This is the structure of the theory. Now. An early critic, a 19th century critic of Darwin, <coughs> saw, thought he saw what this was really all about, and it offended him and outraged him. And he came up with a wonderful passage to characterize this shocking theory of Mr. Darwin's. This he published anonymously in a British journal called Athenaeum, which was sort of like the New York Review of Books of its day sort of the leading intellectual journal. And this is what Robert Beverly Mackenzie had to say. In the theory with which we have to deal, absolute ignorance is the artificer. So that we may enunciate as the fundamental principle of the whole system that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. The capital letters are in the original. <laughs> This proposition will be found, on careful examination, to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory, and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning, who, by a strange inversion of reasoning, seems to think absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. Exactly. That's it. He's right. And it's just as shocking as that, but this is the purport of the theory. This is a strange inversion of reasoning. And to many people, it is still so strange that they find it almost impossible to accept. A creationist pamphlet sent to me by a student some years ago has this wonderful page making fun of this idea. Do you know of any builder? Building that didn't have a builder? Do you know of any painting that didn't have a painter? Do you know of any car that didn't have a maker? If you answer yes for any of the above, give details. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh -huh. I mean, the very idea of such a thing. But that is the idea. That is Darwin's idea. And no amount of hilarity on the part of creationists is going to make it go away. Now I want to turn briefly to Alan Turing, because another brilliant Brit, Alan Turing, had a similar strange inversion of reasoning. And I'm going to draw out the parallel by using the language as much as possible of Robert Beverly Mackenzie uh, speaking in high dungeon. A dungeon. Now, first you have to understand what Turing's uh, uh, inversion was. These are, com these are computers. Uh, before Turing. Uh, not the desks, the people. 
That's what they were called. They were called computers. This was a job. And these are pre touring computers. Most of them had degrees in mathematics and were otherwise unemployed. And they worked eight hours a day computing by the hundreds, by the thousands, in engineering firms and scientific projects uh, all around the world. What Turing realized, that this didn't have to be that way. In the old days, then, computers had to understand arithmetic. You couldn't get hired to do this job if you weren't a pretty good mathematician. You had to appreciate the reasons for what you were doing. And Turing recognized that this simply was not necessary. Here's what he said in 1936 in a famous paper on computable numbers. This paper is, as much as anything, the manifesto that gave birth to the computer. The behavior of the computer, that's a person, at any moment is determined by the symbols which he, it could be she, or it could be it, is observing and his state of mind at that moment. And notice that Turing put state of mind in, in quotes. Just internal state. So here's Darwin. In order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it's not requisite to know how to make it. And here's Turing. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computer, it is not requisite to know what arithmetic is. You see how close they are. They are really two strange inversions at once, and in some sense they're the same inversion. Darwin's and Turing's. Now, what they both stress in an interesting way is what we might call competence without comprehension. Absolute ignorance has the competence to make all these <laughs> wonderful biological forms. And absolute ignorance, AI, has the past capacity to make computer programs of surpassing uh, intelligence. Understanding that is mind, consciousness, or intention is not the cause of this, it's the effect. This is the idea that Darwin pioneered and that Turing helped to articulate and solidify. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about this double-barreled inversion and how we get from absolute ignorance to comprehension and intelligence. Now, I find that many people, when they think about evolution, they've heard enough, read enough in the papers so that they think, yes, okay, okay, okay. Uh, evolutionary theory, evolution by natural selection can explain all the uh, Marvelous details of a bird, how the wings work and the eyes and all the rest of that, yes. But, but not a note to a nightingale. Can't explain that. That's got to be beyond evolution to account for. Well, first stop and think. However wonderful a poem is, is it more wonderful than a bird? Think about the intricacy, think about the excellence of design of a living bird. If evolution can produce that, you don't think it could produce a poem, too, at least as a byproduct? In any case, that's what we want to explore right now. What I'm going to do is sketch the bubble up path, the alternative to the trickle down theory of creation, and see if we can get all the way from absolute ignorance to intelligent design. I'm going to begin with a brief review of what we're made of. What we're made of are trillions of little robots. This is a, an artist's rendition of a motor protein. As the name tells you, it's a protein. It's not alive. It's just a molecule. It's a large polymer. And motor proteins are the workhorses, almost literally, inside every cell. They are what carry around the materials that move things around inside the cell 
uh, every cell in your body, every cell of every creature alive on the planet has these non-alive little robots inside. That's what makes them work. I want to share with you, uh, well, where is it now? Oh, I lost it. Um, I did have a slide. Oh, well, I don't need that slide. I can just do this. And I can do this. This is from a wonderful animation of what goes on inside a cell. I'm just going to show a little bit of this. This is now available on YouTube, I've discovered. Not by BioVisions at Harvard, restriction enzyme. Now here's a microtubule forming out of individual tubular molecules. And here comes that motor protein. This is actually, aside from the colors, a very high fidelity rendering of the motor protein. Okay, back, back to the show. So we're made of trillions of these in every cell in our body. You have about a hundred trillion cells inside your clothes right now. And 10 trillion of those are human. For every human cell in your body with human DNA, you have roughly 9 or 10 interlopers, visitors, symbionts. They come in many different varieties. And then in addition to that, there are trillions and trillions of viruses. Harmless for the most part. That's what you're made of. So you are indeed made of trillions of mindless little robots. Not a one of them knows or cares who you are. And yet, when you put them together, when they get put together, the question is how, in the right way, you get somebody like you and like me. And we know, we care. How is it possible to be, make a knowing, caring mind out of these mindless, non-caring little robots? How is that possible? The details of this story are, are emerging every day. We know the general story, which I'm going to sketch out. Just looking at some of the highlights that I think will help people understand why these are the important major steps. Oh, there's our friend. A little bit out of this. Okay. Here is a picture, a new picture of the tree of life. Uh, the radial dotted lines show years, so we go back three and a half to four, roughly four billion years. Let's see, I will bring my cursor up. So here's where life started, and you'll, whoop, and you'll see that the first things that were created were these archaea and bacteria, and then we get eukaryotes, and everything from there over are eukaryotic cells. I'm going to be saying something about this particular moment in evolutionary history. It's on hair trigger here. Uh, what happened right there about two and a half billion years ago, the eukaryotic revolution. You can see at a glance what was revolutionary about it. Everything from there over to the right is a eukaryote. And that's basically all the living things that you can see with a naked eye. So it was an important moment. Now where are we on this map? We're way over on the far right among the mammals. And if you look at the mammals, now where's my cursor? There it is. Uh, let's see, let's go to, to that little Y right there, that junction. That's where the common ancestor of us and the chimpanzee was. We split off from the chimpanzees and the bonobos 
pygmy chimpanzees about six million years ago. And this gives you a sense of just how recently that was compared to the whole tree of life. Now, back to the eukaryotic revolution. Two and a half billion years ago, there were only prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria. And they've been around for about a billion years, independently evolving, and of course bumping into each other in all sorts of ways, and sometimes eating each other. And one day, one, one prokaryote, A, bumped into another one, B, and B engulfed A. Now, was B eating A? Or was A invading B? What was going on? Well, if you're a prokaryote, it isn't quite so obvious which is which. But the basic idea is quite simple. If B dismantles A and uses the parts, that's eating. If A dismantles B from the inside and using, uses the parts, that's eating too. But if neither one dismantles the other and they just join forces, that's a little different. And that's what happened on this it only had to happen once. It happened at least once. And when this happened, B took advantage of all the design, a million, a billion years of R&D, independent of itself, to simply acquire all that know-how, all that competence in a single moment. And the result was so competent, so greater, so much greater in fitness than either A or B by themselves, that they stayed together, they joined their fates, they kept their genomes moving in parallel, having, having a common fate. Now, some of the genes from B have been incorporated into the genes from A, but in general, the two genomes are still quite distinct. That's how we know that this happened. The scientist that did the most to make this a textbook affair and not just a controversial theory is Lynn Margulis from the University of Massachusetts. I'm very proud to see her get uh, an honorary degree from Tufts University two years ago. Uh, uh, she's one of my heroes, and uh, uh, now she's an official hero of Tufts University as well. And you can see at a glance what's interesting about this. On the left, you see a, a prokaryote, a bacteria. And you see it's pretty complicated, but nowhere near as complicated as the, as the cell on the right. Which is just a single cell. It's a unicellular organism. A so-called protist. And if you look at these yellow things, right there, there, and there, those are mitochondria. Those are the descendants of that, of one of the original invaders that hung around, and mitochondria have their own DNA. So in each of the cells in your body, because you're you care about, each cell has two genomes. It's got your nuclear genome, that's your, that's your human DNA, and then it has your mitochondrial DNA, which you only get from your mother, because there aren't any mitochondrial any mitochondria that are passed through the sperm. So your father didn't give you any of your mitochondrial DNA, only from your mother. And all of that goes back two and a half billion years, roughly, to this moment when A and B joined forces. That's the, the eukaryotic revolution. And it was a major transition in evolution because eukaryotes are more complex, as you can see, and hence they're more talented. They just have more things they can do, they're more versatile. And that makes possible multicellular life forms. But even a single cell eukaryote is quite a competent entity. Here are a couple of sandcastles, both made by eukaryotes. The one on the right, you're familiar with those sandcastles, is made by uh, uh, members of young and old of the species Homo sapiens. The sandcastle on the left is made by a single eukaryotic cell. It doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't have a mind. 
It is just a single eukaryotic cell. It's the amoeba diffugia coronata, and it makes these little sand castles to live in. Just about visible to the naked eye. No bacterium is going to make one of those, I don't think. But these eukaryotes, because of their versatility, this permits a division of labor. And that permitted multicellular life to become possible because in order to make a multicellular thing like you or, a, or an oak tree or a bird or a flower, you've got to have specialized cells and the eukaryotic cell is just made for a division of labor and, speci and specialization. Now, we can see in our map of the great tree of life let me just say a bit more about the great tree of life. How many of you have ever drawn a family tree, a genealogy, where you trace back to your grandparents and as many of the great grandparents and cousins and uncles as you uh, as you know? And you can go back maybe great 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 grandparents, great 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 great. Have you, have some of you have done that. Good. Okay, that's a tree of life, right? The genealogy. This is the ultimate tree of life. This is the family tree of every living thing that has ever existed on the planet. And you notice they all come down to a common ancestor in the end, in Iraq, in the beginning. Uh, and everything that's colored, everything from where it says eukaryotes over to the right, those are all results of the eukaryotic revolution. Those are all, all multicellular life forms are eukaryotes. So we get fungi and corals and worms and spiders and crustaceans and mollusks, sharks, fish, lungfish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, one of the most recent groups to differentiate itself. Now, here is a much simpler eukaryote, the caddis fly larva, and it makes a sand castle too. This is the caddis larva's food sieve sand castle, uh, which it builds in a stream, the water comes in the funnel at the top, and the food in the water gets stuck on the screen that the caddis fly builds in the middle of the chamber. The water continues through, and the larva can just pull the food off the screen. Pretty clever. This is, in fact, a brilliant bit of engineering, a very well-designed artifact for extracting food from water. Here's another one. Lobster trap. It's also made by a eukaryote, a slightly bigger one, Homo sapiens. And it has a lot in common with the food sieve. It, 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 many of the parts have similar purposes and similar designs. They're both, in their own way, excellent, even perhaps optimal for the job that they're doing. Now, what's the difference between them? Well, in both cases, there are reasons for the arrangement of the parts. In the caddis larvae food sieves, there's reasons why this, the, the chamber is the way it is, and the screen is the way it is, and the funnel is the way it is. There are reasons, all right, which we can work out. Also, in the case of the lobster trap. But the difference is that in the caddis case, the reasons are not represented anywhere. They're not represented in the caddis's little brain. It has a tiny nervous system. But the reasons for the design just aren't there at all. They don't have to be. Evolution tracks these reasons, uncovers these reasons, but doesn't bother representing them in the nervous system of the organism that is the beneficiary of these reasons. These are what I call the free-floating rationales of evolution. They're free-floating. These are the reasons why things are, these are the reasons why the wings are the way they are and the eyes are the way they are and the reason why spiders behave the way they do and the reason why caddis fly larvae behave the way they do. All of these reasons, they are the real reasons, but they're not represented in the organisms whose reasons they are. They don't have to be. I'm going to give you one of my favorite examples, which is the cuckoo chick. Cuckoos do not make their own nests. They are what's known as a brood parasite. The female cuckoo, when she's ready to lay her egg, 
looks around until she finds a nest that some other species has already built and already laid eggs in. She waits till the parents fly away. Then she swoops down quickly, lays her egg in this host nest, and rolls one of the host nest bird egg out. That's just in case the host can count. <laughs> and that is the reason. But the mother cuckoo doesn't have to understand that. When the host bird come back, they incubate the eggs, and when the egg is hatched, and it usually hatches first, as a shorter incubation, I mean, you might wonder what the reason for that is, it's pretty obvious. And the first thing that the cuckoo chick does when it's out of its own shell is to try to roll the other eggs out of the nest so that it can monopolize the food gathering capacities of its foster parents. I've been using this still picture for a long time, but now I found a wonderful clip. There is some sound on this, if we can do it. Well, you really don't need the sound. Everything appears normal, but appearances can be deceiving. before the others and is ejecting the remaining eggs. So that it's pretty clear that that's very purposeful behavior on the part of the cuckoo chick. But don't worry, the cuckoo chick doesn't understand what it's doing, doesn't have to understand what it's doing. It is just this innocent little bird brain It doesn't know that it's murderous. <laughs> it doesn't have to know. That's the point. So natural selection, the process Darwin discovered, tracks reasons for creating things that have purposes, but that don't need to know them. Now this is like the need to know principle made famous in the CIA. In the CIA, the need to know principle is there for security reasons. Uh, agents should only be told what they absolutely need to know so that they don't know so much that they can spill all the secrets they know when they get caught and uh, perhaps tortured. So uh, the CIA has one reason for the need to know principle. Evolution has another reason. It's just thrift. If, if an organism doesn't need to know something, it's not going to be equipped with elaborate comprehension machinery in order to understand it, it can be the beneficiary of a very good and very reasonable and very purposeful bit of design without having the slightest clue that this is the case. It's just like the computer doing arithmetic and having no idea that it's doing arithmetic. Or playing chess and having no idea that it's playing chess. This is competence without comprehension. Now, there is a common error made by not just lay people, but scientists too, when they see such purposeful behavior on the part of an animal, uh, to attribute much more understanding to the agent than needs to be there. This is a, a, a sort of romantic over-anthropomorphization of, of, of animals. And I think the reason for this is not just that we're romantic and that we want to love our, our furry feathered or feathered friends, it's that we don't have a vocabulary to deal with this. We don't have any familiar concepts of semi-understood quasi-representations, or semi-demi-understood pseudo-representations, or you can play the game further. That's where Turing comes in, because he provides us with a host of possible concepts for exactly that kind of phenomenon. Representations that aren't really understood by the system that uses them very competently. Now, birds are not all as clueless as our cuckoo. I want to show you 
a film of the smarter bird, which some of you may have seen. And in order to do that, however, I have to do a sort of clunky thing here and bring up another video. And there's no sound with this. So this is a new Caledonian crow. They're very smart. It has a piece of wire here. It's trying to get the food at the bottom of the beaker. And it's not succeeding in getting the food with this piece of wire that it has. So then, look what it does. Impressive. A smarter bird indeed. What's the difference? Well, in this case, Ruth Milliken, wonderful philosopher at the University of Connecticut, she speaks about animals that represent their goals in the same representational system with which they represent their facts. And I think the new Caledonian crow pretty clearly passes that test. Slide. Never mind. Now here's a different picture of the tree of life. It doesn't look so much like a tree, but that's because we're looking at it from a bird's eye view. We're looking at it from up above. You can see in the center is the, the trunk from which every other life form comes, with the bacteria and the archaea, the, the prokaryotes on the top, and the eukarya, us, and all the other eukaryotes on the on the bottom, and Norm Pace, whose diagram this is, it's now a little out of date, uh, has put three genera uh, out here on the end of the book. Coprinus, Homo, and Zaya, what are they? Mushrooms, corn, and us. Yes, you are related to corn. And you are related to mushrooms. And in fact, you're rather more closely related to mushrooms than you are to corn. We're all eukaryotes, and the mushrooms are closer to us, or we could say we're closer to them, than either of us is to the corn. But still, we're related to the corn more closely than we are to most other eukaryotes. Quite a lot of difference between these different species. All of that difference has to accumulate in the time that has transpired since we, since we parted ways with our common ancestors. So we have about three and a half billion years for the whole tree of life. Now, remember I said at the outset we have only about six million years to evolve away from our common ancestor with the chimpanzee. And remember, it's not that chimpanzees were our ancestors. We didn't evolve from chimpanzees any more than chimpanzees evolved from us. You could say that, you could say, well, chimpanzees evolved from us. That would be the same mistake as saying that we evolved from chimpanzees. We both evolved from the same common ancestor, from a common ancestor. And they've been evolving, chimpanzees have been evolving just as long as we have, six million years since, since uh, we parted company with our common ancestor. And all the differences observable today must be due to R&D that's accumulated in that interval. Well, I've been talking about billions of years. Now I just want to go way, in, way up to the near present, just 10,000 years ago. This is shortly after the arrival of agriculture, which was sort of independently invented several times, but mainly uh, actually pretty close to here. And uh, about 10,000 years ago, the calculation by Paul McCready suggests that if you took all the human beings on the planet at that time, plus their cattle, all their livestock, and their pets, that still that whole, if you put that in the scale and weighed it against the rest of the terrestrial vertebrates, the rest of the animals, not the insects, not the worms, not the fish in the sea, just the animals, that we were less than 1% of the animals then alive on the planet. That's 10,000 years ago. Well, it's considerably more today. 
Would anybody like to hazard a guess? What do you think it might be? Hmm? One percent. One percent. Seventeen? Seventeen or seventeen? Seventeen? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. No, you're wrong. The answer is ninety-eight percent. Yes, we have overrun the planet. Us and our lives. But most of that's cattle. <laughs> Thank you, McDonald's. For this transformation to occur in just 10,000 years is a stunning biological revolution or explosion in just 10,000 years. Here's what McCready says about it. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted the thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power, we now wield the paintbrush. All that in just 10,000 years. Let's compare the McCready Revolution, the 10,000 year revolution, with another great moment in the history of uh, evolution on the planet, the Cambrian Explosion, made famous by Steve Gould in his book, How Wonderful Life. This was when uh, a tremendous diversification of body plans suddenly arose, suddenly by geological standards, uh, and, and this occurred, and we can see it very clearly here in the, in the, uh, on, on this uh, wonderful tree of life, if I can get my cursor up here. It's right here. All of this diversity, as you see, very little time passes, and all of these different body types arise in a geological twinkling. That's the Cambrian explosion. It happened about half a billion years ago, but it took millions of years. It's still fast by geological standards. Compare that to the McCready explosion, which is only 500 generations, just 10,000 years. It's not just genes. Our genes haven't changed much from the genes of 10,000 years ago, but why? Golly, we've certainly changed a lot, and the world has changed a lot, and it isn't just genes. In fact, we need biology needs some other factors to explain this. And fortunately, one is available is a second information highway from parents to offspring. All sexually reproducing creatures, organisms, pass on genetic information from parents to offspring. That's so-called vertical genes transmission. But what's available to us and a few other species is vertical cultural transmission. This is where parents teach their offspring things, draw their attention to things. And this is a second information highway. And once it gets going and it gets optimized, we get another takeoff. This is what Richard Dawkins drew our attention to in his book, The Selfish Gene, which is over 30 years ago, 1976, when he introduced the concept of memes. Memes are cultural replicators that are analogous to genes. They're information vehicles, just the way genes are. They're, they're rather like viruses. What's a virus? A virus is sort of a naked gene. It's a gene without a body. It's just a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> it's, it's, like a protein, it's like a motor protein. It's not alive. It's just a macromolecule. It's just a great big molecule. But it has a shape that has a competence without comprehension that is quite astonishing. It has the competence to enter a cell, a living cell, and commandeer that cell's gene duplication machinery to make copies of itself rather than of the cell's own genetic material. It's a, it's a pirate that comes in and takes over the copy machine of the cell. That's how a virus works. 
Dawkins suggested that cultural viruses, means, do the same thing. They aren't alive any more than viruses are or motor proteins, but they do evolve. They have shapes, if you like. They're, they, they have some structure. They're data structures. They're made of information. And they have attitude in the sense that they can get into a copying machine, take it over, and get lots of copies of themselves made. What is the copy machine? It's not the cell's DNA replicator. It's this, the thing between your ears, your neck top computer. That's the copy machine that gets commandeered to make many copies of the same information. Now, a little skeptical interlude. I've just introduced, yet again, as I often have in the past, the concept of beans. And I know there's a lot of people that just hate the idea. They find it repugnant. They refuse to accept even the existence of means. They say, what evidence is there that means even exist? Well, how many of you think that words exist? Are there words? Well, notice if I stood up here and said, words don't exist. I dare say you wouldn't believe me. Because <laughs> what you would be responding to was a three-word sentence. It's pretty clear that words exist. Well, words are means that can be pronounced. That's their sub-variety. There are many means that can't be pronounced. There are other kinds of cultural entities like fads, fashions, ways of recipes, ways of making things, and so forth, ways of shaking hands. But words are the preeminent means, and in fact, they're the means that make the rest of the memosphere possible. What I'm suggesting then is that what makes us so special is that we are apes with infected brains. Our brains have been invaded by all these data structures, which are really virtual machines, what a computer scientist would call a virtual machine. And these virtual machines have themselves been designed not by hackers, not by human virtual machine designers, but by natural selection itself, just the way viruses are designed by natural selection. And these virtual machines give us powers that give us the versatility to take organization up a level. Remember the prokaryotic revolution, eukaryotic revolution. You get this tremendous gift of billion years of R&D and you just incorporate it into your own agency. The same thing happens with means. We get all of this beautifully designed thinking material, all of these engines of reason, if you like, virtual machines. We simply install them in our brains and it enhances our powers. The key to this as with computers is digitization, and as with DNA. DNA is a four-digit alphabet, A, C, G, T. Languages, words, are made up of slightly more phonemes and letters, you know, between 20 and 30, depending on the language, roughly speaking. And I want to just illustrate how language digitizes tradition, and this is the key. This is why we have culture and chimpanzees don't. I want to do a little, a little uh, uh, experiment with you. What do you see? Read it? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, most of you are not native English speakers, and yet still, you see the cat. But look closely, and you'll see that the H and the A are exactly the same shape. You have involuntarily, unconsciously, without comprehension, you have corrected those. You have turned those into the proper letter. That's the key to digitization. Now this is, these are words, uh, this is written language, but the same thing goes for oral language. And I want to give you an example. So we're a little exercise here. Listen carefully. And after I say what I'm going to say, I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? Mundify the epigastrium. Again? One more time. Beautiful. That's case one. 
Here comes case two again. Repeat after me. Are you ready? What did you go to one man and the man? Again? <laughs> I can't even do it again. What's the difference? It wasn't that I mumbled or spoke more softly or had a brass band playing at my elbow. It's that it was composed of vocal sounds that you couldn't digitize. When you learned English, you learned the English virtual machine which automatically, automatically digitizes everything you hear and helps you copy it with high fidelity. It's that high fidelity copying that makes the accumulation of culture like the accumulation of design in genetic evolution where we have the high fidelity copy of the genes. You don't even have to, it doesn't have to mean anything. In fact, you wonder if I have the epigastrium. Uh, this was something that uh, my mother's old lawyer used to say when he came over about supper time and wanted a drink. He'd say, I think it's time to bundify the epigastrium. I wondered what that was when I was a little boy. But he was handed a glass of bourbon and uh, ice, and that seemed to do the trick. And if you look it up in the dictionary, it means to soothe the lining of the stomach. <laughs> but anyway, it didn't have to mean anything, as long as it was made of the right kinds of phonemes. Mundify the epigastric. Mundify the epigastric. Mundify the epigastric. Doesn't make any difference what tone of voice you say, or whether you say it with a draw or an accent. We can correct those to the norms in the same way we turned that those, the H and the A, we closed the A and opened up the H. It's the same automatic correction, and that's the essence of digitization. That's how high fidelity copying is possible. What, what we have here are typographical errors or typos, which can be corrected. My hacker friends, software engineers, have a wonderful term that they use in addition to typos. They talk about thinkos. <laughs> What's a thinko? It, it's an error that's a sort of one step up from a typo. It's not a slip of the tongue or the finger. It's a slip of the mind. It's doing something the wrong way when there's a right way that you know perfectly well. Oh, I just made a thinko. Uh, very common in software engineering. But in fact, there are thinkos there are systems of thinkos and their corrections throughout human culture. They compose what I call semantic alphabets. Not just lexical alphabets, but semantic alphabets. If you, if you ever took a course in pottery, you learned how to throw a pot on a potter's wheel. When you started, you didn't know what you were doing. And after you become adept, you learn a lot about the materials and about the means of shaping them. And now, when you look at another potter, not your teacher, but some new potter walks in and starts making pot, and you look at him and say, oh my gosh, look what he's doing. He's doing this, he's doing this, he's doing this. You couldn't see those moves before you became an expert, before you acquired the semantic alphabet for making pots. An experienced potter watches another potter and sees Modify the epigastric. A novice looks out and sees, what are you doing? You just have no way of parsing that into the moves. And that's the difference between us and chimpanzees. They do have some cultural traditions that they can pass down, like termite fishing, nut cracking, uh, courtship rituals. But basically, it's just, they don't have, they don't have the articulation that you get with language, which permits the accumulation of mutation, in effect. So our power depends on the culture that permits us to divide labor and share expertise. That's how come the McCready explosion could occur in the last 10,000 years. What you see here on the left is a termite castle. On the right is 
Antonio Gaudí's Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. They look strikingly similar, but they're hugely different in the way they were designed and built. Here we see on the left the interior of a termite mound. On the right we see the interior of the Great Pyramid. Some similarities, but also huge differences. And here's an even more remarkable case. This is K-25, which was built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee during World War II. When it was built, it was the largest building in the world. The people that worked there and the people that built it had the faintest idea what it was all about. What it was doing was extracting plutonium from uranium ore. It was deep secret, and the people working on it had no need to know, and they were kept ruthlessly in the dark. They had the faintest idea what this was all about. So you might say, oh, you mean they were sort of like termites, busily doing their thing? Except for one thing. In the case of the termite hill, nobody understands. There is no representation of reasons at all. But in the case of Oak Ridge, there were a bunch of geniuses who understood exactly what this was, how it was supposed to work, and in fact, you couldn't build it without them having from the top down this sort of knowledge and com comprehension for the first time. For the first time, we're getting competence with comprehension, and that is the key to the difference. So if we look at the fruits of the tree of life, we see that spider webs are artifacts made by eukaryotes, and so is the worldwide web or a power grid. These are artifacts, but very different. A beaver dam, a hoover dam, both made by mammals, but very different in that the hoover dam is constructed by intelligent designers. The bird's nest is a brilliant piece of work, beautifully engineered, but the bird doesn't understand what it's doing. That's how it really does. To some degree. This is all, not, this, none of this is absolute. So if we want to consider the delicate transition from bottom up of Darwinian R&D and top down creative genius type R&D, we see that the key is the accumulation of means by human culture, the creation of language. My friend Bodalba once put it brilliantly. He said, you can't do much carpentry with your bare hands. You can't do much thinking with your bare brain. What you need is thinking tools. <clears throat> Fortunately, there's a lot of them lying around, and we just install them. These are the gifts of culture. If you think of words as tools, as thinking tools, they're not all as elements of grammatical constructions. For instance, passwords and labels are individual words have standalone uses and utilities even though they're not, they have no grammatical uh, uh, role to play. My friend Doug Hofstadter, in his book, I Am a Strange Loop, his most recent book, gives us a list of his favorite, you might call these hand tools. These are cognitive tools, they're idioms, and I wonder if you know most of these. They're very useful English idioms, they're all somewhat compound, they put together English words to make very nice little cognitive tools. Here's a few of them. Wild goose chases, tackiness, dirty tricks, sour grapes, elbow grease, feet of clay, loose cannons, crackpots, lip service, slam dunks, feedback. If you have these concepts, these words, these memes, in your kit, you can associate things, distinguish things, see similarities and differences much more effectively and efficiently than if you don't have them. These are all very useful, small tools to have in your kit, in addition to the big tools. These are tools made of what? Well, of information, of technique. They're sort of recipes for action. They're a little bit like Java applets, the kind that you download every day when you're attached to the web. What are applets made of? They're made of bits, zeros and ones, information. So are cultural items like words and other bigger virtual machines like long division or calculus. What's long division made of? 
It's made of moves. It's an algorithm. It's an abstract computational thingy. And it's the, what Turing showed us is the key to our own powers of comprehension. These are what a computer scientists would call virtual machines. They're made of information. So this is the technology that remade our brains and made our brains unlike the brains of chimpanzees that make our minds. Well, who designed these treasures? In a few cases, we have particular named famous cultural heroes who designed some of our best cultural treasures and thinking tools. You know, the names that are carved in the marble at the top of the library. But most of the tools that we acquire, nobody designed. Nobody designed language itself. Nobody designed tonal music or maps or money. And yet these are well-designed artifacts as well. And the design work was done by differential replication, by cultural evolution. Well now, what are you then that uses these means? Are you a Cartesian ego with a, what Searle would call original intentionality? No, I don't think so. I think what you are is an alliance of any semi any understood choice out representations. They've got together in your brain and they have made a virtual machine, made of smaller, simpler virtual machines. And once it's in there, then it becomes a sort of cognitive immune system. It guards the door, enters and evaluates the other virtual machines and decides which it's going to accept. Now, in The Origin of Species, Darwin begins the book by talking about first methodical selection, that's plant and animal breeding, this is artificial selection. Then he talks about unconscious selection, where the people favored some animals over others, but had no intention. They were not trying to improve the breed. They were just simply, you know, uh, uh, eating the grunts and breeding the rest, and the gradually improving the breed over time, but that wasn't their intention. And then there's natural selection, uh, without any human intention, without any design or purpose by anybody at all. All three varieties of natural selection. In our own day, we've had a fourth, of course, and that's genetic engineering. We don't wait for the right genes to come together. We actually splice them together right away and then see how well the organism does that we insert them into. We can do the same thing with means. We have the natural selection of what we might call synanthropic means. Synanthropic species are those animal and plant species, but mainly animal species, that live with us, with sin, with anthropos, human beings, such as rats and mice, squirrels, pigeons, barn swallows, bed bugs. They're not domesticated. They're wild, if you like. But they are evolved to thrive in human company. And there are means, similarly, that are not domesticated, they're wild, but they thrive in human company. They evolve by natural selection to do well in our midst, such as superstitions, rumors, but also words. Words are not domesticated in many instances. Nobody invented them and nobody owns them. There are people who are the usage police that try to ride herd on words, but in fact words do very well without the usage police. They're like they're like rats, they're like pigeons. We have unconscious selection of means, such as the differential replication of tunes, it's when you can't get a, a catchy tune out of your head and then you hum it a few times and then you pass it to your neighbor who hates you because you didn't want to be coming that tune and then she passes it to somebody else and it spreads virally, as we say. This is unconscious selection. It's not that you say, hey, listen to this tune. This is a wonderful tune. That would be methodical selection. No, no, this is, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pass that tune to you. The Germans call them earworms. Wonderful name. Then there's the methodical selection of domesticated means. You know that laying hens, chickens, 
would not, they'd go extinct if it weren't for human help. Because their broodiness, their instinct to sit on their eggs has been, in many species of varieties, has been bred right out of them. They don't know enough to sit on their eggs. So human we have to have incubators for those eggs. Well, domesticated beings are just as hard to reproduce. It takes a lot of hard work. One of my favorite cases is calculus. Or, or maybe the students here at Savachi find that calculus is just, it's just this, you just can't get it out of your head. It's so catchy. It's just so infectious. Am I right? I don't think so. No, it takes a lot of diligent work, a lot of, of imposed replication to get the thing to replicate and stick. And of course, we have nomadic engineering. We have things like advertising and uh, public uh, relations and the like. And people just trying their best to dream up good means that will, that will go viral, as we say. Now, I'm almost at the end of my talk. I want to talk a bit about bootstrapping from competence to comprehension. And I'm just going to look at one case, which is the sort of can stand it for thousands of others. How do you draw a straight line? Simple. Take a piece of paper and a pencil and a straight edge, and you put the straight edge on the paper, and then you draw the pencil along the straight edge. Yeah, that's how you do it. How do you make a straight edge? Well, <laughs> you take a piece of metal and another straight edge, and you put the straight edge on the metal, and you take a knife or something, and you pull it along. And where'd you get that straight edge? Um, let's see. Uh, we have a sort of problem of a regress going there. It's not an infinite regress. It's a finite regress. And it goes back several thousand years. And there's actually an interesting history of the evolution of the technology of making straight edges. And they got better and better and better over the centuries as people figured out how to take the straight edges they already had and use them to make better straight edges and to improve those straight edges and measure those straight edges and criticize those straight edges. This is about as good a straight edge as you can make in 1970. This is an illustration in that book on the evolution of straight edges that I found. And it's very good. It's very, very good uh, at resisting bending and it has uh, very little thermal expansion. This is about as good as you could make uh, a circa 1970 as a straight edge. But it's not perfect. Here, in fact, is the edge with its imperfections in the vertical dimension magnified a millionfold. And you see it's not so straight after all. But look what we have here. This diagram is a wonderful example of what we and only we can do. Here is a diagram that doesn't just represent the purpose. It represents the falling short of the purpose. It represents the deviations from perfection and when you have diagrams like this, when you represent the reasons, then you are on a different plane and you can really start to do intelligent design. The ideal of a perfectly straight line, Plato might have called it the form of the straight, was arrived at by approximation over thousands of years. It didn't just arrive from on high from Plato's heaven. Approximation of both artifacts and of the very idea itself is represented in the minds of those who are making the artifacts. And the form of the true has a similar history. In fact, the main artifact here is science itself, where means are being selected for truth, for verticality. It's not perfect, but even the deviations from perfection can be identified and to some degree corrected. So we finally reach genuine intelligent design. It turns out we are the first intelligent designers in the history of evolution on this planet. What makes us human is as much our brain children as our genetic children. We alone represent our reasons. And this means that we can think about our values and our reasons in a way no other species can. And this is the source of our creativity. We, the reason representers, can now look back at the history of evolution and discover the reasons everywhere in the tree of life, the unrepresented reasons, the free-floating rationales. 
It took Darwin to figure out that a mindless process discovered all those reasons. We, intelligent designers, are among the effects, not the cause, of all those purposes. Now, normally I wear a little pin, the Darwin pin with the legs, indicating evolution, of course. I, I lost my pin, I have to get another one. So I don't have one, but here's a picture of it. One meeting, an evolution meeting I was at, uh, the physicist Murray Galman saw it and he said, oh man, I like your, I like your Darwin pin, that's great. Uh, he said, did you know that the, the symbol, the fish symbol that it is a parody of was the first acronym. Here's the Greek word ichthys, ichthys, the word for fish. And he said, did you know that ichthys was short for, was an acronym for Jesus Christos Theodios Soter, Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Savior. That's why the Christians use the fish symbol. That's a fascinating marine. I like that guy. That's me. And he said, what I want to know, Dan, is what does D-A-R-W-I-N stand for? <laughs> okay. Well, as you can perhaps tell by my pronunciation, I'm not a classical Greek scholar. So I couldn't do the Greek. But I did have some high school Latin, so I thought I would work on it. So I said, let me have a cup of coffee, I'll come back. It'll be a half an hour, I'll see what I can come up with. Well, of course, there isn't any W in Latin. So I had to use double U. <laughs> D-A-R-W-I-N. Uh, but I did come up with something that I rather like. Some of you will have enough Latin, perhaps, to remember, but Delaray from, from Remember Carthago, Delenda Est, Carthage is destroyed, or delete is a modern word from the same group. Delare autorum rerum, destroy the author of things. Ut universum infinitum noscas, destroy the author of things in order to understand the infinite universe. Thanks for your attention.